Um, hi, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Gabe, for inviting me to Ubisoft to talk about diversity and representation. So for some of you, this may seem a little 101. It may seem very basic, but I can't assume everyone's level of knowledge or comfort in discussing these topics. So if I do go into topics that you think are very um, easy or things you've already talked about or know about, feel free to kind of take notes to send to your colleagues who aren't here today. Um, I believe it is being recorded, so folks in other areas can see this as well. Let's see. Now, let's see which direction I should point the clicker. Yay, I figured it out. Um, so this is just what the talk will cover. Um, if you want to tweet, go ahead. I know some people are already tweeting about me coming over to talk to you all. So you can either tag my personal Twitter, which is Cypher of Tear, or I Need Diverse Games. So we're all adults. I'm not going to read at you for the most part of these slides because I hate when people do it to me. Um, I do know a lot of you in the room, so yay, my friends are here. I will not be an entire nervous wreck during this presentation. Um, but a little bit about me for those that have not seen my work or know who the strange person is coming to talk to you about diversity. So if you've seen I Need Diverse Games on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, or the shirt, because it's what I do, um, I started actually a couple years ago because I was literally angry about video games a couple years ago. And part of that anger was at the whole too hard to animate women. So in part, thank you, because that motivated me. Um, and at the time I was tweeting about it and using the hashtag, some of my friends with a much larger Twitter following retweeted me, so it started to trend. And over the course of a couple days, um, many people decided they want to continue the conversation. So I started a blog, I started its own Twitter, its own Facebook. And when someone who has 40,000 Twitter followers, followers retweets you, it generates a lot more traffic than you're used to. So that was a very strange morning to suddenly wake up and have like hundreds of notifications. Um, but now I need Diverse Games' its own community. It is part of the GDC scholarship program where we're able to send 25 people to GDC with an all-access pass. And we're also working with Xbox Gaming for everyone and other companies. And I'm just a big nerd and I love video games, so that's why I care so much about it. So these are kind of basics. Again, if this does seem very basic to you, if it's something you already know about, jot down notes for your colleagues or for people that may or may not um, have these down. So very simple, why should you care? Because it's the decent human thing to do. Um, I mean, this room is not very diverse. However, the world outside is, and we, you're in Montreal, I'm in Chicago, there, there are many people there that play games and it's not just the same 18 year old bro dudes that are they're playing your games. And for those that are white or white appearing, it, the gaming world has been theirs or so they think. So that's why I think a lot of us should care about it because it's not as simple as going, you know, the status quo is fine, the status quo should not change because money or whatever reasons. And knowing that, it may make you wonder who's playing games. And I actually have some stats. I came prepared. So these are from Pew Research, um, Gamers and Gaming in December 2015th and March, April 2015th. Did anyone here go to PAX West? Is that a no? Okay, so at PAX West, um, I, gave, I was part of a panel where we talked about making the case for diversity with stats because for some people, all you need is statistics. They're not really interested in the human angle of why you should do it. I know, stats are boring puppy, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, these stats disprove the idea that women don't play video games, that a lot of women don't play video games. In fact, we're almost half of the population that plays games. An interesting stat that was in there was adults who own a game console broken down by race. And this was something I had not thought about deeply before this panel and, and starting to give talks at studios. 43% of adults own consoles. That's a lot of people, a lot of brown people and black people that are not being served by not getting games that reflect them. And also Hispanic people. So we actually outnumber white people in one area, if not population, than by folks who actually own consoles. And 42% of women own consoles in, in the household. Now, to be fair, I'm not sure how they're considering ownership, if they mean they bought it for the household, if, they're, if each person in the household owns their own console, but this is how Pew reported it back. And again, 53% of black non-Hispanic adults are playing video games, as well as 51% of Hispanic adults. This last stat on the slide is interesting because 
there's a lot of contention over who calls themselves a gamer. You know, men 15%, which is much lower than I actually expected. I thought a lot more men who play video games would call themselves a gamer. And unsurprisingly, many women don't because of the rather unsavory um, connotation of, of the word. So ESA essential facts. The ESA report is always online, it's free, it's a PDF, anyone can grab it. It's not like paywalled or anything like an academic resource. So from this year's report, so 63% of households have at least one person who games three weeks or more, three hours a week or more, and they have a device used to play games. Now by device, they probably mean anything from your cell phone to a tablet to a console to PC or, um, I'm sorry, mobile devices. And this stat made me happy because most gamers are over 35 years old. We are not catering and we should not be catering to the 18 year old bro dude, white, cis male demographic anymore. 41% of gamers over 35 are female. And what's really interesting is that women age 18 and older represent a greater portion of the game playing population than boys 18 years or younger. So when people give you that stat and go, oh, well, it's just kids, it's teenagers, you can actually point them back to this and go, no, you're actually wrong. But player diversity, like literally, where are the brown and black and, and other folks playing games? And there's not a lot of research done on it. There, there's not a lot of drill down into ethnic um, stats other than the, the Pew data I showed earlier. And I looked, I really looked for it. I couldn't find anything even going back a couple years or coming out this year. If there are articles or research studies being done, perhaps they're behind academic paywalls. What I did find was a Nielsen study that looked specifically at LGBTQIA and Asian players. Why that specifically? That's probably the parameters Nielsen set. And this is linked, so when you get the presentation, you can actually look at the data. And there's a Pew Institute article that looked into it more in 2015. And the next slide um, talks about portraying minorities poorly, because a lot of people probably don't think about that. They think gaming is fun, and it's something I do. They don't think about it in the sense of representation. So some minorities didn't think about it. Um, some black folks, 13% surveyed, said that video games do portray us poorly. And when I get to future slides, I will explain that a little more in depth. But very rarely do I see good representations of black people. We're usually thugs or drug dealers or people to be shot at and killed. We usually don't live very long in video games. Um, and this is one of the things where if you are part of the majority, you're not gonna see it. You're not going to think about how someone else is portrayed because you don't have to. And it's, and it's not a terrible thing. It's not because you're consciously being racist or anything like that. It's just you're not forced to think about it until you see games where you, you have a black lead like this year with Mafia 3, Battlefield 1, and Watch Dogs 2. So very quickly in summary, why care about it? Because you're humans, it's the right thing to do. But from a business point of view, and if there's any businessy type folks in the room, you're leaving money on the table, just flat out. You are leaving money from people who are not being served. Um, there's more of the same story. There's so many times I can go to medieval England, or fake medieval England. I like fantasy, I would like to go somewhere else. Um, your player, I know I've said this, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's true and I think people need to hear it repeatedly. Your player base is not 18 year old white boys, assume straight. And there's a lot of people of color, queer folks and older gamers that are not being served. So you're leaving money on the table and you're not thinking about your player base fully. So it's a little bit more past the one on one. And I wanna focus on things to think about when creating a person of color and or an LGBTQIA character. And I know that Ubisoft has done this before, but it doesn't hurt to look at some basics and some tropes you may or may not think about. Um, and I should have an asterisk up there. Negative can be negative for some people. For me, all these are negatives. And for other gamers that I know, I'm a big Dragon Age nerd and knows this. <laughs> Um, I'm a huge Bioware fan, however, um, Vivienne was one character that portrayed a lot of negative stereotypes for people of color. Um, she was a strong black woman stereotype. Uh, before I go on, do people know what I mean when I bring up these stereotypes? Do I need to explain them? Raise your hand, speak up. That is because you, sir, are a white man. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Good, I'm glad you're here. Um, so strong black woman stereotype is basically strong black women are there, they're there to take care of everyone else, they don't have emotions, they don't need to be cared for, they're there to be the caregivers, and they never get to show emotion, they never get to be the damsel. So basically, you're here, you're here to take care of us, AKA the mammy stereotype, um, which some people may be more familiar with, but the idea is a black woman only gets to be strong, she only gets to care for others and never have that emotional moment for herself. She never gets to have self-care, be the one that's rescued. She's always a very strong, person and usually she's given like kind of masculine traits or things where you're not going to think of her as feminine. Her, usually her femininity is stripped away as well. Um, Ice Queen because literally if you ask Vivian if you can date her she laughs at you and she's very much aloof. This is who she is. She's very much about power. Um, she's very ambitious and manipulative. And the last one I found out through a friend who warned me about this dialogue. Um, if you're walking around with, with another character in your party, there's dialogue where, she, where he is kind of repeating thoughts in her head and he talks about being so dark she can't be seen with the lights out. And that is a very old negative stereotype about black people where you know the assumption is we're very dark and if we don't smile, you can't see us. So those were things that pinged to me as very negative. Um, Letitia the Trash Lady. Um, do people know what step and fetch it is? So step and fetch it is a very old, very stereotypical negative routine that was done by people usually in blackface where they said, yes, a master called each other coons. They basically were, you know, foils for, for white people. And this character, when you hear her talk, she sounds like she stepped out of one of these skits. And I actually stopped playing the game because I was just like, no, how did this get past anyone? Um, and she's basically there to be, be a useful tool for the protagonist. And Witcher 3. I love the game. I played it, you know, at first I wasn't going to play Witcher 3 because I played the first two and didn't like them. But he's very much the tragic gay trope. Um, if anyone's played Witcher 3, you run into this character early. And he's exiled out in the woods in a cabin. And he's pretty much out there because, you know, he was in love with a princess, with a prince. He got caught and he's happy, not happy, he's out there, and he's accepting of that because he calls himself a freak when Geralt talks to him, and Geralt mistakes him saying a freak for meaning lycanthropy. He's like, no, a different kind of freak. So, and he's just out there in the woods, and it reinforces the, the idea that being gay or queer is bad. It's a positive representation. The asterisk is here because, again, this is subjective. I, you know, I know a lot of people love Mafia 3. I love Mafia 3. A lot of people don't like it. They feel that this is just like a black dude out there being violent, and they hate it. Um, so Neris, I brought up Guild Wars because I can actually have hair like mine in this game. It's an MMO. Um, again, Lincoln Clay, because I get to be a black dude, and he's, you know, he is violent, but it's a Mafia game, so trade-off. But he's a lead, finally. And remember me. So she was black female lead. I know the game didn't do well, but but it also didn't get marketed very well. So you might be wondering why I didn't include Evie or Aveline. Um, I love Evie. Um, Carrie's writing of Evie brought me back to Assassin's Creed, actually, as a fan. So, well, it's great that we got Evie. You could have had an actually historically accurate female assassin in the title. Or she could have been just the protagonist for Syndicate. Because switching off between her and Jacob, while it's an interesting mechanic, I would have, I would have loved, loved, loved to have her, have her own game. Um, and Aveline, she didn't even get her own like full-fledged AAA by herself title. She got a Vita title that was then upgraded. So you know, it's great that you have her, but you know, she is a character that could stand on her own. So that's why I didn't include her in part of the positive representation slide or either of them because. It's a small step, but there's a lot more that could have been done, and there were lost opportunities with Evie and Aveline. Um, and also, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Adewale was great, but he was a sidekick, and then he was DLC. So, while they're great characters, there's a lot more opportunity there. So, tropes. If I speak about a trope, please feel free to raise your hand and say something, or call out and say you don't quite know what it is, but these are just the definitions of tropes. So basically, a cliche. So if, if your black characters are always quote unquote urban, or you know they speak a certain way that you think black people speak, which is 
inaccurate because AAVE is its own dialect of English. You know, there's not a set way that black people speak or act. And so when your characters act that way, you are reinforcing a stereotype and a trope. Um, if your character always dies, if your black character, your female character always dies for the advancement of your white male protagonist, that is a trope. Don't do it. Again, I'm not going to read it to you. We're, ad we're adults, and I know this is going out later. So just a couple things to think about when avoiding tropes. So hopefully when there's a POC protagonist, all in their own Assassin's Creed game, we'll see we won't see these. Again, don't describe them as urban or thug, have them speak in slang, because usually if you're not part of an in-group, you're not gonna get the slang and it's gonna sound really contrived. And people will tell and they will talk about you. And it will not be a fun time on Twitter or Facebook if that happens. Um, do not overemphasize the darkness of their skin or strangeness of their hair. And by that I mean natural black hair usually isn't done in games or it's not done well or it's described as like Brillo or coarse or like a sheep. My hair is not like a sheep. It is actually very soft. So don't do things like that because that's, again, that is like othering these characters in ways that you would not do to an actual person, I hope. Um, don't have NPCs or other characters comment on how well they speak. So well spoken, you speak so well, you're so articulate is never a compliment to a person of color, be they real or digital. Um, when I say give your character Eurocentric facial features, I mean there are certain markers of, of blackness and of Africanness and not whiteness that will come across in character creation, you know, fuller lips, certain ways in which we look. So if they basically look white but you gave them a brown skin tone, it may look weird. Now if you're saying the character's mixed race, that's one thing and you know, you never know how genetics will come out. But if you made the character unmistakably black, like Vivienne, you know she has wide lips, wide nose, she's very dark skinned, that there's no mistaking her for anything but black. But she has blue eyes. That is my other nitpick with her. And last but not least, don't make them a foil for other characters based on their own identity issues. There is more to someone than being black or being gay or being fill in the blank. You know, there's a thing called intersectionality. We are not all, we're not one thing, we're intersectional. Now, how to do this when you're talking about LGBTQIA character, and that is a lot of letters. Um, so let's get away from the tragic, I'm gay, I'm queer, I'm bi, and, and everything is terrible, life sucks, nothing, I will never be happy again. Um, because while some people do have, you know, everyone goes through their realization differently, that does not everyone's experience, nor is that how you should portray kind of coming out and coming out to yourself first and foremost or to everyone else, because yes, some people are miserable being LGBT, but that is not the sole experience. Again, don't define someone by their orientation, or I should say a character, or people either, that's bad. Um, people are not one dimensional, characters shouldn't be either. Um, don't have a character be predatory. If you establish their LGBT and their behavior is predatory, that is a very nasty trope, that especially if you have someone who's bisexual and you're portraying them as greedy. Um, and speaking of bisexuals, love triangles, just stop. Just stop doing it. Um, polyamory can be happy and healthy and in a game. Fallout 4 did it. Um, do not pull the you trick me thing for trans characters if you have them come out in the game or in the text. That actually has gotten people killed and it's a very nasty trope. Do not reinforce it, do not put it in there. Um, trans people are not trying to go out and trick other folks and that's not something to reinforce. Don't queer bait. Um, now, I don't know if this is true or not because of the internet, but I'm not sure about Jacob in AC Syndicate. If anyone can confirm or deny. Okay, so we, I had no way of knowing that as I played the game. So that, is, that, is a, that would be queer baiting, where it's out there, it's kind of subtext, be explicit, just say it, because queer folks, we're thirsty. We are really thirsty for representation. So if a character is explicitly LGBTQIA or somewhere on the spectrum, just say so. You know, there's a way to do it respectfully and there's a way to do it well without kind of, maybe, maybe not, we don't want to get into it, just, just do it. Um, and lastly, don't kill your queer characters for plot because we like to live too. Look at the way people reacted to the 100 and other media where queer characters were killed off for basically no reason. Um, this comes up a lot, especially more in fan spaces, but also in how people interpret works. Um, I've seen a lot in how people talk about Star Wars and other, other works for characters of color. 
Don't use food words. Never ever describe someone as cafe au lait or chocolate or caramel or vanilla or any combination of the above. And if you have a mixed race couple, don't use chocolate swirl. That's just, you know. <laughs> look, <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Just don't do it. Um, again, if you describe natural hair for a person of color, it is not like steel wool, it is not like a lamb or animal. Just don't compare it to an animal. Don't compare it to anything other than hair. Um, and I know this probably will never happen in a game, but don't have one character ask to touch another character's hair and don't do it in real life. L you all laugh, it has happened to me. <laughs> um, avoid describing gay or bi male ID characters as limp wristed, lisping, or other negative markers, because again, that's the negative stereotype. Even if there's a quote unquote good reason, your player is a human sitting here with this content and that is going to affect them. Um, same for female ID characters. Don't use things like dyke, bull dagger, other slurs to be, and avoid them. Because if I, as a bisexual woman, am sitting there playing this game and I hear these slurs, it's going to take me one out of the game, but two, it's going to be a slap in the face. Um, and if possible, run dialogue and character descriptions past someone who's in that in group. So if you're creating a black character and you don't have a black friend, which sounds weird, I hope you have at least one black friend. We're in Montreal, there's black folks, I've seen them. Um, you know, consider a consultant, consider what's called a sensitivity read because you are outside that group and there are going to be things that you're not going to pick up on, not of maliciousness, but because it's just not an experience you've had. So here's a checklist, take a picture of it. Um, is this character stereotype? Kind of go through and, and think about other media you've seen that is stereotypical or has tropes in it. Does this character match up with any of those? Um, do they line up with other tropes as well? And have you checked with someone else? Because even if you are the most aware and, and well-meaning individual, you can still make a mistake. And again, it's not a maliciousness. It's just these are not your experiences. There are things that you just aren't going to pick up on. Um, so internally, if you can do so, if it's an NDA issue, you can't share it outside the studio, that's one thing. But if you can either get a consultant, and I know of a couple of consulting firms that you can reach out to, have someone go over this. Make sure that it's you know something that, even if you fine tooth combed it, have one more set of eyes on it that is not deep in the project because I've been in projects where you're just tired of it, you want to be done, and it's easy to make mistakes that way. Um, check for problematic language, ableist language, um, racist language, obviously, or things, again, where you may have grown up with it, it may not occur to you, um, like me, I'm trying really hard to get ableist language out of my out of my vocabulary because it's not something anyone ever called me on until recently. Um, does your POC or LGBTQIA character die for the sake of someone else, usually a white dude? So he has that man pain to go on. Don't do it. And does a non-human character present in a way that could be read as a stand-in for people of color? Now, this may or may not apply so much to what you all are doing, but if you have non-human characters, a lot of times they are inadvertently coded as people of color, they have hairstyles that are red as black, they have mannerisms that are red as black. Um, Iron Bull in Inquisition would be an example where he is explicitly non-human, but a lot of fans and a lot of other people read him as a person of color. Um, this is something I did not have the last time I gave this presentation, but one person did ask me for resources. So basically, people that you can read, places you can go to for information, and a point of view outside of your own. So these are just some of the people that I know them, I trust their word, therefore I'm giving them as resources to you. One thing I do want to add as a caveat, do not be creepy and do not message them or follow them and ask them to explain things to you and for the love of God, do not ever tell a person of color, educate me, because if you get blocked, they will laugh at you and talk about you for weeks because as a white person or a white passing person, all they're going to see is yet another person who has found them on social media and wants a free education for stuff that you could easily Google. Um, but all of the people on here have podcast episodes, they have articles that you can go read, and a lot of times they're writing from experience, not just, oh, the game's great, this is why you should go play it, this is more as a person of color, as an LGBT person, as a woman, as an intersection of the above identities, this is where I'm at. Um, especially, you know, relevant to Assassin's Creed and other things, MedievalPOC.com is a great resource, and she focuses through art history, but, you know, she disproves the whole, hey, there were no brown people before 1800s and slavery. 
Um, and then my own resources are at the bottom of the list, which are our podcast and INeedVerseGames.org. Okay, so let's say you did everything you're supposed to do. You, you did your work, you did your due diligence, you still goofed, it happens. So this is kind of the end of it and then we'll have Q&A. What do you do when fans react? And I've seen fans react to Ubisoft, so it, I know it happens. And unfortunately, I've been one of those fans on occasion, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, you've done all you can, you've done your homework, so what do you do about fan reactions? So a lot of times fans are great. You know, they tell you either in forums or on Twitter or someplace that they don't, they don't get very vitriolic with you. They just go, this is something I, I played or I saw and it wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, and there's usually a good dialogue that can happen. Um, I just wanted to throw out some previous criticisms that either I've made or I've seen. Um, again, not enough people of color, Adewale and Aveline available as DLC or mobile titles. Um, so these are not anything new. The last one is the four look like white dudes in Unity. Um, that actually is what kind of got me away from the series. Because I got four with my PS4, I was really happy, and then I saw Unity and I was like, nope. So where people dogpile and you know harass, and usually they find someone that isn't more as well known, they may, or they may harass people that have a blue check mark and decide that you know you are the face of Ubisoft or you're the face of this game and I'm gonna harass you about it. The question is how do you handle it? Because it can be very hard to do so, it can be very hard when developers, I'm sorry, or fans come at you and they're not coming from a place of reason, they're not coming from a place of, I don't wanna say interest because they're very interested in what you're doing, but they're not having a good faith argument. That That's not where they're coming from. So let's not be that dev. Um, so just things to consider because, you know, let's say you have a fan of color and you do something in a game and that fan of color is not happy with it and they don't approach you in good faith, they approach you like, oh, y'all are racist or whatever. I've seen it happen, trust me. I've, I've been a Bioware fan for a long time. Um, so I have seen this happen, not here, but with other, other studios. Main thing is, and I know this is hard because it's hard for me when it happens to me on Twitter, is don't get defensive kind of step away, give it a minute, because you don't know where that person's coming from. It could be a place of genuine hurt, it could be something in your game triggered a point for them without intending to, or maybe whatever they saw in a game that was like their straw for the day. So try not to be defensive about it. Also try not to take it personally, because you are the accessible person in that moment that they are angry. So it's not them finding you and attacking you, hopefully. Um, don't be dismissive either, because again, you don't know where someone's coming from. I know that's hard, but if someone's coming to you either in anger or frustration and you blow them off or you just block them right away on Twitter, that's going to send a message of, as far as they're concerned, Ubisoft doesn't care about me, which isn't what is going on, but maybe you don't have time for it. Maybe you've had your limit of people tweeting at you about whatever the thing is. Um, realize when it's appropriate to respond because not everyone deserves a response. I know that may sound contrary, but not everyone gets your time. The only people who should get your time are the people that you can in good faith engage with. And the meet button is great, so they don't know that you're not seeing their tweets, but you don't block them and they can't yell about it. So mute often, and now you can mute keywords. So you can just mute them and keep going. Um, but no one to engage because sometimes just a meaningful, hey, I, I hear you, I see what you're saying, can mean a lot to someone whose initial reaction could be very frustrated, very angry. And no one to step back, just say, you know what, this is getting us nowhere, I'm just gonna let you do that and go meet them and go about your day. Um, I'm sure you have PR and marketing, check in with them because maybe there's messaging that you should be follow, falling in line with. And it's, you know, it's not towing the corporate line, it's, this is where we are with this franchise, with this moment, and I don't want to step out of line because you don't want to be the one to lose your job because someone's angry at you and you responded in, in a fit of anger. And also, no one to apologize. I've, I've rarely seen it, but a lot of times there's no apologies that happen on either side. If someone is very hurt, you lash out at them, they lash out at you, and it kind of goes back and forth, and then you cool down the next day, no one to apologize, assuming no one's blocked everyone on Twitter. And if possible, reach out, follow up, just go, hey, we started this conversation on Twitter. 
is there another way to contact you? Because Twitter is not the best place to have these conversations. If it's a Facebook post, again, find a way to reach out and talk to the fan and take it offline. Because a lot of times, that is when things can de-escalate and you can have a meaningful conversation. Some of the best conversations I've had with devs has been like, hey, I saw you do a thing, I saw you say something, is there a way to talk to you outside of Twitter? And go from there. But again, don't be afraid to block people, don't be afraid to meet people. But, but take a moment and step back and think about that fan, think about where they could be coming from, especially if they're a person of color or a person who's queer, who's been hurt by something in the game inadvertently, because I don't believe the devs are out here doing things to be racist and mean and, and hateful intentionally. So that's how to find me, a lot of it, um, both my personal and any diverse games, and I left business cards when you all came in. I want to thank Tanya very much for coming and talking to us today. Thank you.